Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. At the June 4th Coronavirus Press Conference, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Indiana University, Kirk White, discussed changes to the university's vaccination requirement. He clarified that students, faculty, and staff will still be required to have the vaccine to attend IU, but the need for documentation has changed. You know, this past week, we did uh, announce, uh, and I'm, I'm so pleased that IU Health joined us, uh, We've both been able, as two of the largest employers in Indiana, to have a vaccine requirement. Indiana University is holding firm with that requirement, and all of our faculty, staff, and students will be required to have the vaccine for fall semester. What we adjusted this week had to do with the documentation. IU Health President Brian Shockney said that IU Health employees need to be fully vaccinated by September 1st. He added that the company would honor employees who are not immunized but still receive their final shot before the deadline. So we need to have uh, them vaccinated, fully vaccinated by September 1st. That is to say, though, if someone were to get their final vaccine uh, prior to that date, we would certainly uh, honor that. Uh, but that, just like any other uh, deadline, you have to set the date, right? And so that is the date that we want to work toward. Indiana University spokesperson Chuck Carney stated that a coronavirus press conference is planned for June 11th, but hinted that a non-weekly schedule may be in the works. The Bloomington Redevelopment Commission discussed the old hospital site reuse project at their June 7th meeting. Project engineer Patrick Durkis presented the design contract for phase one of the project. He explained that since this contract designs the demolition package, phase one is focused on the land east of the hospital site. And so this project will design the demo package for it because the demolition that was part of the agreement is for the main hospital site. Um, and so this, this will uh, design the demo package and then also replat it for future development and uh, build the new roads, the uh, Madison, and then also uh, the Greenway, which is an unnamed street so far, uh, and the amenities with that. Dirk has said that most of the land in phase one is owned by IU Health. Commissioner David Walter asked for clarification on land that Bloomington does not own yet. And Commissioner Nick Coppice asked how the contract would be affected if the city cannot get that land. Dirk has said the contract includes those properties, but the project will not slow down if they cannot be acquired. If you look at the schedule, this is an extremely fast paced project. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to reach a point where we had to sit on our hands and wait until uh, we had additional funding approval. Um, we wanted to make sure that this uh, that this was going to take care of all of it. Commissioners voted to approve the contract four to zero. The Bloomington Utilities Service Board discussed hazardous waste disposal from Bloomington storm sewers. Assistant Director of Environmental Programs James Hall presented a partnership that would initially cost the city over $109,000. He said changes in the project will reduce that cost significantly. The contract amount, I will say this, is for $109,000. That was based on 2,500 2, cubic yards of material. We got approval today from the delineation that VET did to only have to dispose of 600 and some odd cubic yards, which comes out to 900 and something tons. So it should only be about $25,000 contract all said and done uh, for all the material that we're, that we're gonna have to dispose of. The original, when we started doing this process, was originally to get rid of everything from Third to Smith, but now we've been able to kind of shorten that down. Board member Kirk White wondered why the city had to pay if a business caused the damage. Hall said Bloomington would have to foot the bill now in order to continue with the Hidden River Pathway project. This was my conversation that I had with Item as well, is like, how are we responsible? It's not our waste. Um, they, they consider it's just kind of in place, but since we're trying to remove it, then we're going to be responsible for disposal of it. Um, this doesn't mean that we can't. Um, and I don't know if Chris is on the call or not. We couldn't go back and try to get compensation back from the property owner of where the contamination came from. But if we want to move forward with our project, we're going to be responsible for footing the bill and, and, and paying for 
the removal of the material. Board member Amanda Burnham asked whether the disposal project would cause delays in other local projects. Hall was not sure. Board members voted to approve the partnership unanimously. Monroe County Public Library Director Marilyn Wood talked about the future funding for MCPL at the June 8th Monroe County Council meeting. Wood requested authorization for the library to issue bonds to help pay for building maintenance. She also talked about plans for the new MCPL branch. What our future holds for us is a new Southwest branch at 890 West Gordon Pike. It's right next door to Bachelor Middle School. Um, it is uh, a planned 21,000 square foot building. It's customized to meet some the specific um, services and uh, enhancements that the community identified through those discussions and surveys that we had as we did our branch feasibility study. Council member Marty Hawk said her question has never been about how much the library asked for. She wondered whether the library would be making enough to cover operational costs as well. From the very beginning, my question has not been what does it cost to build the building, but making sure that we've covered operational costs because we don't want to do something that will sink the ship that because we're successful now and we want to stay that way. Council member Jeff McKim asked about the effect of annexation on these plans. He questioned Wood on whether the library's projected annexation losses will affect the bond amounts. Just taking that 180,000, let's call it 200,000, let's say it's an underestimate and it's really a $200,000 estimate. How does the uh, impact, how does that affect your ability to right. operate existing and new branch? It, it will um, obviously impact us because it's a, a big chunk of change, but we anticipate continued surplus operating uh, funds and even beyond the new operational costs that we will have in the branch. So we will be paying our bills with the new operations expenses and still have surplus in our operating budget, which will be there as insurance for any of those reductions in revenue. Counselors approved the resolution unanimously. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate a staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. The web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and try and find a stable family, a stable place to live. Without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone and it also helps others. CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. The Bloomington Commission on Sustainability talked about the environment at Wapahani Bike Park. At the June 8th meeting, Commissioner Nejla Routsong discussed her efforts to find out why a dam was removed from the park. She cited concerns that the decision to remove the dam was made without considering its effect on local wildlife. I'm just trying to track down what assessments were made because um, I want us to be able to, uh, you know, I'm certain whatever damage is done is probably irreversible, even if, you know, um, it would be something that would be decided. But um, basically I wanna make sure that we learn 
any lessons from from this. Commissioner John McGee suggested Commissioner Routsong speak with the Environmental Commission. Commissioner Nolan Hendon said he would get in touch with the project manager at the Bloomington Utilities Department. The next Commission on Sustainability meeting is on July 13th. The Bloomington Board of Public Works also discussed the Bloomington Hospital Reuse Project. Project engineer Patrick Durkis presented the engineering contract for Phase 1 of the Hospital Reuse Project for approval. He explained that Phase 1 will build infrastructure around the main hospital site. We are building the, uh, the infrastructure, the storm, the water, um, coordinating with utilities for, for gas and electric connections. and. Uh, and then building the streets. Uh, and again, this is, you know, I, I feel uh, the engineering department is well equipped to take on this, uh, this type of a task. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's gonna be a great step to, uh, to take the uh, infrastructure burden off the developers and allow, uh, and allow uh, you know, probably more interest uh, and quicker action on this site. Board member Kyla Cox Deckard asked for clarification on the project developer. Durkis replied that the developer would be chosen later, but that the city will have land prepared for when a developer is hired. The city will take on the construction of everything of, of this design, um, but there will be development ready lots uh, available for future developers to come into. Correct. Board members voted to approve the contract two to zero. The Monroe County Board of Commissioners discussed the Southern Meadows PUD as recommended by the Monroe County Plan Commission. At the June 9th meeting, Assistant Director of Planning Jackie Nestor Jellin presented an ordinance to rezone the Southern Meadows major subdivision into a PUD. She specified that the rezone would only add five new structures but would double the density. Many of the aspects of the previously approved Southern Meadows subdivision under the medium density residential subdivision remain the same, though I will point out a few differences as I go along. So overall, the PUD proposes an additional five structures compared to the approved medium uh, Southern Meadows major subdivision, um, but it's doubling the density. Petitioner Kendall Kanoki said the goal of this PUD is to build workforce housing in Monroe County. Commissioner Penny Githens questioned whether the units would be affordable for working class residents. She said residents would have to make almost $30 an hour to afford a loan on the properties. I got onto the IU Credit Union's um, mortgage calculator okay. and, and um, just for the um, without taking into account sort of mortgage and I'm sorry, with, without taking into account um, anything except the utilities and the mortgage, um, you would need a, a monthly income of um, around $5,000, which wow. is a lot more than 1827 an hour. And if you take into account, and this is for people working 40 hours a week, not 35, um, and if you take into account um, the property taxes and homeowners insurance, you're up to over $30 an hour. Commissioner Julie Thomas commented on the difficulty of this decision. She said this PUD may not be the best use of that land. Is this something where we're going to say, well, that was the best decision um, for this particular piece of land? And, I'm, and I just can't get over that line myself. Um, we do have to consider um, these surrounding areas and we do have to consider the fact that, that this is not the kind of development that we foresaw um, when we, we started, um, when we worked through our, our planning and zoning processes. The commissioners rejected the ordinance two to zero. The Monroe County Stormwater Management Board reviewed three capital improvement projects at its June 9th meeting. MS4 coordinator Kelsey Fatonia highlighted Indiana's intent to use American Rescue Plan funds to help with local stormwater projects. She identified three shovel-ready projects that would receive a grant for 50% of the project cost. Our proposal is to submit for Baby Creek, Zip Road, and Morris Creek Road projects. Um, 
these have to be stormwater related projects that are shovel ready and these are definitely going to be shovel ready for this year so we hope that they are um, highly ranked um, you know the the drainage issues that we would be fixing here with this much money would be pretty pretty significant, I think. Fetonia said the state would prefer that Monroe County use ARP funds to match. Board member Julie Thomas added that even if the federal government said the county could not use those funds, there are plenty of other options for funding. Board members voted to support the grants three to zero. The Bloomington Economic Development Commission debated the Woolery Mill Ventures compliance in its tax abatement. At the June 9th meeting, Commissioner Jeff McKim questioned Woolery Mill Ventures LLC's tax abatement resolution. He asked Assistant Director of Small Business Development, Jane Coopersmith, for clarification on Woolery Ventures filings. The reason he's reporting zero is because Woolery Mill Ventures doesn't have the anticipated employment. So initially this was going to be um, a hotel development, and I think they thought the 45 employees would be theirs. But there is employment employment associated with this development and this property. Um, right now, it belongs to Cassidy Electric, which is a separate entity, and um, One World Catering, which is a separate entity. Commissioner Kurt Zorn said he feels Woolery Ventures has made significant investment, but that the company should present an update to the commission soon. Commissioner Vanessa McClary pointed out the commission had already asked for an updated report. Cooper Smith said staff at Woolery Ventures would be happy to give one in the future. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. I'm at risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of regretting what I do just to join the crowd. I'm at risk of being told not to tell. And you would never know it by looking at me. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, there for me every day, believing in me, showing me what's possible, I can be strong enough to respect myself and my body. To say I can rather than I can't. To say no with no apology. To be a leader. To finish school. To own my future. To break the cycle. Girls Inc. believes every girl can succeed. That's why the trained professionals of Girls Inc. are there for our girls every day, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in a safe, girls-only environment building bonds that last for years and change that lasts a lifetime. Girls Inc. gives girls the tools they need to boldly face challenges, to resist peer pressure, to be the first in their families to go to college, to beat the odds. With Girls Inc. in her corner, every girl can be healthy, confident and resilient. She'll do more than dream about her potential. She'll reach it. With you in my corner. With you in my corner. I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. For my future. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls Inc inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Welcome back to Cats Week. 
The Bloomington City Council Committee of the Whole started discussion of the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA fund. Corporation Council Philippa Guthrie presented the four general categories that ARPA funds could be used for. The first is to respond to the public health emergency with respect to the coronavirus disease 2019 or its negative economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses and nonprofits, or aid to impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. The second is to respond to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency by providing premium pay to eligible workers of the city that are performing such essential work, or by providing grants to eligible employers that have eligible workers who perform essential work. The third is for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue of the city due to the COVID-19 public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year of the city prior to the emergency, that being 2019, uh, or to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband, broadband infrastructure. Council member Isabel Piedmont Smith pointed out that a strict reading of these guidelines excludes housing and arts. Guthrie clarified that the categories are meant to be read as broadly as possible. They want this to be broadly available for recovery, and, and they've realized that the way that communities have been affected is um, very broad. So for example, um, the arts, um, I don't know if it's specifically mentioned arts, uh, but it certainly mentions economic recovery and the arts are an, a big part of the economic engine that, that runs our community. So um, I have no, no doubts that it could be used for that. Council member Jim Sims asked for clarification on when ARPA money could be used. He asked Guthrie which funds would need to be used in what order. I think I heard earlier that you said part of the process would be to uh, take care of some of the projects or expenses by using our funds first and then using the ARPA money as backup. Is, is, did I understand no, that correctly? Yeah, not our funds. Other, or, other or use federal other funds. funds. Yes. Oh. Other federal okay. and state funds. There's, there is just this enormous outflow of money from the feds, uh, some, some of it coming through the states. Um, and you wanna be sure you're maximizing what funds you have a shot at. Um, I mean, the ARPA we have, but it would be nice to supplement or use other funds first. Council members voted seven to zero to make a due pass recommendation. The ordinance will be continued at a future regular city council meeting. Landfill and Environmental Compliance Director Lee Paulson presented the organization's monthly report at the June 10th Monroe County Solid Waste Management District Board of Directors meeting. He highlighted that May's groundwater sampling was completed and sent in for testing. Now that we can do our groundwater sampling in May, um, we hit that pretty hard, Mary Beth and I, um, the first two weeks and got through everything. Uh, without any issues, kind of before weather, kind of in amongst that kind of stuff, everything went pretty smooth. Um, all the samples were all uh, sent overnight FedEx to uh, Element Materials up in Fort Wayne. And we're just right now, I'm just waiting for their report and their documentation of all the, the samples to forward them on to AECOM for statistical analysis. So. Board member Penny Giffens noticed a significant difference in rainfall from 2019 to 2020. Paulson said last year had the highest rainfall since the county started tracking groundwater. Since we started this stuff, last year was the wettest year we've had. So, I mean, uh, more three or four or five inches less than last year is, I think, more average, more typical. The next Solid Waste Management District Board of Directors meeting is July 8th. The Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission discussed a historical building on North Morton Street. At the June 10th meeting, petitioner Rich Ham talked about buying a historical building at 601 North Morton Street. He clarified that he wanted to keep the spirit of the current building when making renovations. We have a vision of, of you know, keeping the spirit of the building and, and keeping what's important to everybody to the greatest extent possible and balancing that with 
you know, uh, a, a little shiny new feel to it that that fits with the city's vision for the, for the area. But beyond that, you know, the vision isn't really fleshed out yet, and we want you guys to, you know, influence uh, where we go from here. Commissioner Doug Bruce showed support for the project. He talked about the historical importance of the building and his excitement that someone was willing to put the work into restoring it. Obviously, this building really needs someone's attention soon. I, you know, every time I go by it, I keep thinking I, I just don't. Again, I know it's a costly renovation, but you just at some point we don't want to lose this building. So I applaud you uh, undertaking this, and 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 definitely, uh, I think it's a it's a very worthwhile project, and and I I I can't wait till we see some of the ideas that you guys are going to bring forth. The next meeting of the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission is June 24th. The Public Safety Local Income Tax, or PS Lit, committee met for the first time in 2021 on June 10th. At the PS Lit meeting, committee members discussed who would review applications for funding. Committee member Jeff McKim read a statement on behalf of committee member Cheryl Munson. She wrote that delegating applications to the Monroe County Council without recommending any funding is a waste of the council's time. Last year, fire departments spent time preparing applications. The county council com committee spent time reviewing and ranking applications and preparing recommendations for the PS Lit Committee. And the PS Lit Committee awarded no funding to any of the applicants. The county council does not want to participate in such a waste of time again for our committee members, the county council, and the fire departments. City of Bloomington controller Jeff Underwood stated that the city recommends that the committee not approve funding unless it is for one of the four major applicants. Committee member Scott Oldham agreed, but said he would support reviewing applications for emergency funds. I think we should consider emergency funding requests. I mean, if they can verify that this is truly an emergency and we have to have this, as we did a few years ago with the SCBA tanks, that we should most certainly look at that. Um, but some of the wish lists that have come before this, this committee in the last four or five years have been... Um, at least in my mind, problematic as it relates to general fund monies versus what is supposed to be supplemental funding. Um, quite honestly, I would be in favor of looking at the emergency level funding. Um, but beyond that, I would uh, kind of concur with Mr. Underwood that uh, it should go to the four qualified providers or the four providers that are certified, and then they can distribute monies as they see fit to um, other parties as they wish. Committee members agreed to review applications themselves this year. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.